Kia ora, everybody, and welcome to Victoria. I'm just going to begin with the usual uh, health and safety announcement. So in the unlikely event of an emergency, we want to make sure you know what to do. Uh, take a moment, I feel like I'm on an aircraft here. Take a moment now to look around at where the nearest exit is to you. So there are some at the back, and some at the front. Um, if there's a fire, uh, if the fire alarm sounds continuously, please evacuate the building using the nearest exit. For an earthquake, act quickly. If you are able, please drop to the ground, get under cover, and hold until the shaking stops. If there's no cover, put your arms over your head and neck to protect them. After an earthquake, stay inside and gather in one place until it is safe to exit. If the building is unsafe, then evacuate. Take your belongings, beware of falling debris, and make your way to a large open space. Follow the guidance of your host. Um, so that is the, uh, the, the safety briefing, and hopefully we will not have to uh, take action from it. We'll just begin uh, with a very short video. Tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā koutou e whakaronga mai ki tēnei kōrero e pā ana te tai ao, te ao katoa. Kia ora. I'm uh, Jo Tindall, I'm New Zealand's Climate Change Ambassador and I'm also co-chair of the Ad Hoc Working Group on the Paris Agreement, a real mouthful which, uh, which is known as the APA. My name is Anna Broadhurst, I'm the Head of Ministries Climate Change Unit at the COP. I will be the alternate head of delegation, which means that when the minister's not in town, I'm running the New Zealand team. This is an international meeting, so multi-governmental decision-making process. This COP is not about taking uh, momentous or final decisions. It's a, a, a waypoint along the way before final decisions are taken next year. My name is Seamus Dunn. I am a policy officer with the climate change team in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. My name is Kay Harrison. I'm lead negotiator on carbon markets for the UNFCCC. Kia ora, my name is Alicia Bagasra and I work on international climate change policy as it relates to agriculture and forestry. My name is Stephen Walter. I'm a climate change specialist at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. The atmosphere at a COP is incredibly intense. They're pretty hectic. Going to a COP, it's, it's hard yakka. It means going without sleep, it means battling jet lag. It's busy, it's fast paced. You are often working from uh, around about 6 a.m. to occasionally 2, 3, 4 a.m. Every COP is different. It has its own atmosphere. It's usually in a different part of the world. This year, Fiji is hosting. We're not in Fiji, but they will be bringing a bit of um, buller spirit. The other Kiwis there come with NGOs. They're part of the youth delegation. Businesses, um, mayors from different cities around the world. It's a whole, whole host of different people. It's my first major multilateral uh, meeting overseas. My first opportunity to represent New Zealand as a negotiator. And of course, it's just gonna be a lot of fun. Personally, it is a big challenge. What keeps me going though, I have I have two children. You know, we are we are in this for for the future generations and for the future of New Zealand. New Zealand's priorities, we, we see climate change as a global issue that requires a global response. First port of call has got to be what we do at home in our own transition. We need to get a clear sense of where parties agree and where they don't agree. We want to see agreed conclusions on all seven items on the APA's agenda. Amongst the guidelines we are developing, one of the, the most important is about the transparency framework. And what that means is the way countries communicate to each other, how they are going implementing their commitments. We want to continue the progress of the negotiations themselves on the rule book with a view towards completing it for 2018. It's crucially important to get the foundations right, to, to make sure that, that everything is on track uh, for uh, the right outcome next year. Well, that uh, just gave you a bit of a, an introduction to not all, but a number of the negotiators who will be at the Bonn uh, Climate Change Conference this year. Um, and a couple of them, uh, Steve Walter and Kay Harrison, will be joining me today in uh, delivering parts of this presentation. 
So as, uh, as usual, we'll begin with uh, um, a bit of an outline uh, of uh, the state of play of the climate change negotiations, the upcoming conference in, in Bonn in a couple of weeks' time, a week and a half's time, uh, and uh, the hot points, the priorities that we uh, expect, what our expectations generally are for the outcome of the, the COP this year. Um, uh, I have to, of course, acknowledge that since we emailed the invitations for this event, um, there have been, of course, quite significant political developments and uh, a new government has been formed. Um, I know uh, that uh, probably everyone in the audience is, is very interested in, in what this means, but I do have to start um, by saying that it is too early uh, to know or to have clarity in any detail um, on the uh, impact of this uh, change of government on uh, New Zealand's uh, no negotiating positions. The guidance we have at this stage um, is pretty much what uh, everybody has through uh, the coalition um, agreements, the arrangements um, between uh, the support parties and uh, speeches that the, the Prime Minister, um, very shortly to be formally Prime Minister and uh, Minister uh, for Climate Change, have given. Um, so this briefing is going to give you a more general update uh, and uh, be a little bit more broad brush uh, about New Zealand's uh, priorities and interests. And of course, we will be uh, engaging very early and very soon uh, with the new minister, James Shaw, um, in order to talk in a little bit more detail about uh, the upcoming COP with him. So... Um, this is, uh, of course, a briefing uh, in advance of the annual Ministerial Climate Change Meeting, and it's the second uh, such meeting since the historic Paris Agreement was adopted back in 2015. Um, the, there was a real head of political steam, as we know, that got the world to Paris, um, together with a very innovative approach to uh, setting a, um, a global agreement. The foundation for that agreement was, of course, um, a principle of national determination, a kind of bottom-up process of, of uh, governments uh, determining what they could do according to their circumstances, but with the, the global agreement setting some very clear expectations around um, ideas of progression, uh, no black backsliding, continuous improvement. The Paris Agreement broke a number of records. Um, the UN Secretary General hosted uh, a big day in April 2016 to open the agreement for signature and 175 um, uh, ministers turned up to sign on the day, um, which was uh, um, a record. And that was 175 out of uh, the 197 uh, UNFCCC parties. Uh, New Zealand, of course, uh, joined, w was one of the, the 175. After that signature, governments began their domestic processes to uh, ratify uh, the Paris Agreement, and uh, the agreement entered into force once a threshold of 55 parties, 55 governments, representing at least 55% of emissions was reached. Well, that broke another record. Everybody had kind of expected that it would take the normal three, four years, three years or so, uh, for the agreement to, to actually enter into force, but uh, the date uh, was, uh, in the end, the 4th of November 2016. Uh, fairly uh, interesting date, given what happened four days later uh, with the US election. Um, the... Uh, US, under the uh, Obama administration, had really given a hugely strong political push to get the Paris Agreement across the line. Um, of course, uh, right in the middle of the COP uh, in Marrakesh last year, that election um, in the US cast doubts, given uh, President Trump's campaign promises to, quote, cancel the Paris Agreement, unquote. Indeed, as we know, uh, the president did announce uh, his intention uh, for the US to withdraw from the Paris Agreement in June this year, although at the same time he said that uh, the United States would 
re-engage to find better terms uh, for the US to, to rejoin. There is a four-year period before that withdrawal can take formal effect. So the, the, the date uh, when it would take formal effect is the 4th of November, 2020. Um, in the meantime, though, the United States has confirmed that it intends to remain engaged in the negotiations, including on the Paris Agreement, and it will have a team in Bonn. Um, so uh, this has been a new development um, since the last time, the last time the UNFCCC formally met was in May, so that was ahead of President Trump's announcement. And it's not clear yet uh, exactly what impact uh, the uh, US announcements will have on the negotiating dynamic in Bonn. What we can say, though, is there has been absolutely no domino effect. Um, the uh, um, steady stream of signatories and ratifications uh, of the agreement have continued since COP22 in Marrakesh last year. Um, at last count, 195 out of the 197 uh, UNFCCC parties have signed the agreement. The only two who haven't are Syria and Nicaragua. Um, and indeed, in the last couple of weeks, um, Nicaragua has signaled it's changed its mind um, and uh, its president announced uh, that uh, the country will sign within the next few days. Um, at the next stage, uh, the last time uh, we looked, 168 parties have so far ratified the agreement. And in the wake of the US um, announcement, there were strong reaffirmations of commitment um, with uh, uh, countries around the world really uh, confirming they are deeply committed to the Paris Agreement, are beginning work to start implementing their nationally determined contributions, their NDCs. Um, in the engagements internationally, uh, um, since the middle of this year, there's been very active uh, uh, thinking about the Paris Agreement work program. Um, which is the, the program to flesh out the details of the treaty's high-level uh, provisions. It's going to be a very big part of Bonn, uh, but it's not the only part. Uh, there are multiple bodies and multiple negotiating ag agendas. And I know you cannot read uh, the, um, most of the words, but it's impressionistic, this slide, to give you an idea of the structure of the UNFCCC, the, the governance structure, and the various bodies that, uh, that are in place. Now, all of those bodies that are highlighted, the COP, the CMP, the CMA, the SBSDA, the SUBSTA, the SBI, and the APA, all of those bodies are meeting simultaneously um, in Bonn. So there's a, a lot going on. Uh, the COP is the, uh, the one ring that rules them all. It's the, the uh, pr body that, that oversees the whole UNFCCC. The CMP is the governing body for the Kyoto Protocol, and its counterpart for the Paris Agreement is the CMA. I won't go through what all those uh, um, abbreviations stand for. Then there are two permanent subsidiary bodies that get on with business as usual under the, the UNFCCC, the SUBSTA, um, which is on scientific and technological advice, and the SBI, which is a subsidiary body on implementation, and a, um, an ad hoc body. The APA has been uh, convened, established, with um, a, a defined lifespan and a defined role to help deliver the Paris Agreement work program and to do so uh, by the end of 2018. Um, I should note, though, that the love was shared. Um, while the APA got the bulk of the work to do under the Paris Agreement work program, uh, some of the, uh, the responsibilities were allocated to other um, subsidiary and constituted bodies. So the SUBSTA, for example, has responsibility for negotiation on markets. Um, the Standing Committee on Finance um, has a, a role to play with regard to, to finance, um, as indeed ha, ha, has the SUBSTA there too. The 
Paris Agreement Work Programme, I'm not going to call it the PORP, um, the Paris Agreement Work Programme has multiple uh, negotiating streams, um, and they're just uh, listed there. Uh, information and accounting, adaptation, transparency, global stock take, uh, compliance mechanism, uh, carbon markets, uh, and the future of the adaptation fund. That covers most of them, uh, most of the main areas, not absolutely all of them. Um, but, and, and we will talk through in a little bit more detail uh, a number of those over the course of the presentation today. The Paris Agreement itself, as we know, was a pretty slim 11 pages um, with some very high level provisions. It was accompanied by a 22-page set of decisions, COP decisions, that set up mandates for work to be done to bring the agreement properly to life, to give, put some flesh on the bones to, to give the detail. Um, so the original thinking was that we'd have until 2020 um, to sort out this uh, whole work program, bearing in mind the likelihood of entry into force taking two or three years. But um, with that rapid entry into force, uh, we had to step up a gear. So from Paris to Marrakesh uh, to Bonn, uh, we're now working to a firm deadline for all the multiple components of that Paris Agreement work program to be completed, ready for adoption uh, by the time we get to Poland uh, in December 2018 uh, for COP24. Um, we, um, each year, we know that a different party from a different uh, UN negotiating group uh, plays host, pre presides over the COP. This year, Fiji is to preside, um, but the COP uh, is going to be held in Bonn. So that's a slight departure from uh, tradition, but uh, what it has meant uh, is that it is an historic first for a small island developing state, and certainly um, a, a state from a, the Pacific uh, region, to uh, preside over a COP. Um, we were in, and, and it's to be held in, in uh, Bonn from the 6th to the 17th of November. We were in uh, Nandi last week for the ministerial pre-COP, which sets the scene for um, the COP itself, um, with some 68, countries represented around the table, a lot of interest um, in, the, uh, in the COP this year. Um, and uh, I, th I suspect a number of delegates will be longing for the warmth, both in terms of temperature and welcome, um, of Fiji itself, rather than um, heading to a northern winter um, COP, which will be uh, perhaps uh, a little bit uh, more of a grit your teeth to, uh, to cope with the weather. Um, so uh, for Fiji, this is a massive diplomatic and logistical effort. Um, it's a global meeting, and they're very conscious that it is global, but the spotlight uh, will be firmly on the Pacific, um, and Fiji will be making sure that uh, the COP is infused, as they say, with um, the Buller spirit. Um, Prime Minister Maine Marama is to chair the, uh, um, the COP, will be the COP president, and he's outlined Fiji's priorities. So I've just listed them there on the slide. Um, definitely want to see good progress being made on the Paris Agreement work program so it can be very clearly on track for conclusion uh, in Poland next year. Um, the uh, Paris Agreement set up what was called a facilitative dialogue, um, not a particularly helpful name, Fiji, at the pre-COP, successfully rebranded this the Talanoa Dialogue. Um, so wanting to reinforce how they wish to conduct this di dialogue next year, which will take place, will culminate um, at the COP in Poland, uh, and is all about um, assessing collective progress towards the uh, agreement's long-term temperature goals. So the Talanoa Dialogue um, the design of that um, needs to be confirmed uh, by Fiji and Morocco as the COP presidencies at COP23 this year. 
Fiji has also been talking about um, uh, bringing together a grand coalition uh, of governments, uh, non-state actors, cities, businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and to do that, uh, they will be putting a great deal of emphasis on the climate action uh, agenda. Um, the other uh, things that are listed there, um, Fiji wants to build uh, a legacy through a better aligned focus on oceans, uh, and uh, not oceans generally, but the, the, the nexus between oceans and climate change, uh, which obviously around the Pacific um, is uh, an issue of particular interest and covers uh, quite a range of, of um, sub-issues from ocean acidification uh, through to rising sea levels, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They also look at, want, uh, want to look at ways to enhance disaster risk insurance. Um, and uh, as part of the agenda from Paris, uh, to uh, confirm uh, and um, uh, set up the uh, Indigenous Peoples Platform, uh, that is about trying to uh, find better ways for engagement of indigenous peoples um, and recognition of the importance of traditional knowledge in uh, climate change negotiations. Um, and finally uh, mentioned there, they wish to uh, confirm and launch the Gender Action Plan, recognizing that women are most often uh, more directly and negatively impacted by climate change and also looking at ways of encouraging uh, more women in leadership roles um, within uh, and around the UNFCCC. So, Bonn in uh, uh, a couple of weeks' time will be, as has been the case for the last few years, a COP in two parts. Um, physically slightly separated, but apparently with bikes and things um, in order to be able to get from one to the other. We'll be hoping it's not raining too much. Um, the Paris Agreement and those um, ongoing negotiations under the various subsidiary bodies and the, and the COP itself will take place in um, what has been termed the Buller Zone. Um, and separately but alongside the climate, climate action agenda will be taking place in um, the Bonn Zone, a little bit further down the Rhine. And that's going to host multiple side events um, high-level events, country pav pavilions and so on, with a very strong presence expected from cities, businesses, NGOs, um, indigenous peoples, academics, um, et cetera, et cetera. Very important, I think, uh, and a desire on the part of all the, the hosts and the parties to the UNFCCC to really demonstrate um, and uh, uh, reinforce the vision of Paris both in terms of the legal agreement and in terms of action on the ground. We are getting on with it. Not sure of total numbers uh, yet, but uh, judging by previous experience, we're probably likely to see at least 12,000 people um, split pretty roughly 50-50 between uh, the um, official negotiators uh, and uh, NGOs and others. This means that Bond's accommodation will be straining at the seams. Um, like others, New Zealand began reviewing its actions and policies in light of the Paris Agreement. And it's been really obvious in every single international meeting I've been to since that that is where the political focus has been. We've got an NDC, now what do we need to put in place to um, uh, ensure we can deliver it? Um, so, uh, as I said at the beginning, with a, a new government, uh, it's um, a little bit too soon to say what will change, um, but of course, uh, with climate change uh, already confirmed as a top priority um, and uh, anticipating a, um, a climate uh, commission, um, this is uh, you know, giving us a sense of, of where things will be. Um, I'll just just uh, um, to indicate that uh, our focus is driven by two things. So first of all, um, it's driven uh, to some extent by our emissions profile. 
which um, I know I've been saying for, for a number of years is, uh, is I hope, ingrained in, in uh, everyone's minds, dominated by agriculture, and here you can see it's pretty well 50-50 um, between methane and, and nitrous oxide, uh, and uh, with forestry playing a very significant role. Uh, and uh, by the looks of things, looking at, at uh, policy statements from the new government, um, playing an even bigger role uh, in the future. And the third um, component there that, that is really important um, is carbon markets, um, which certainly in the um, short term help us to enhance the uh, ambition um, of the, the targets we take, and, and Kay will uh, talk a little bit more about that aspect of the negotiations very shortly. The second thing that determines our focus is um, the desire and need to see good progress on the Paris Agreement work program. Um, we uh, are a country that, that relies pretty heavily on the international rule of law, and the whole point of um, having an international treaty is to balance off what individual governments might be doing, uh, promising to do, um, by um, setting some collective parameters um, so that we uh, understand the rules of the game, if you like. We can have confidence about what we are all doing um, and we can understand the meaning of the uh, undertakings or pledges that, that uh, countries have nationally determined uh, for themselves. So within that Paris Agreement work program, um, uh, particularly highlighting the need for uh, clear and workable and robust, credible um, rules around transparency, accounting, um, and a, a properly functioning uh, committee to uh, facilitate implementation and promote compliance. Steve is going to talk a little bit further about those. So uh, just to, to recap here too, New Zealand's targets are um, uh, set out. So uh, first target was under the Kyoto Protocol that ran from 2008 to 2012. We then took a target under the Convention, which is our current target through to 2020 of reducing our emissions to 5% below uh, 1990 levels. Is that telling me something? <laughs> um, the Paris target um, is the next one. Uh, the, our NDC committed us uh, to reducing our emissions to 30% below 19, uh, 2005 levels by 2030. And the third one there um, at the moment um, is uh, a gazetted uh, target to reduce our emissions 50% below uh, 1990 levels by 2050. Um, however, you will have seen uh, that the new government has uh, indicated uh, quite clearly that there is an intention to get to net zero emissions by, by 2050. So that's just a, a current snapshot um, of where we are. Um, here I'm going to stop uh, and pass over to, uh, to Kay to talk a little bit further about those carbon markets issues. Uh, ngā mihi aroha ki a koutou. Uh, good morning, everyone, and ni sambula vanaka. I'm getting into the spirit. Um, you see here one of the areas of the negotiation is about carbon markets, and that comes from Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and it's an important article because it's about what are the things that we can do together to make the boat go faster. And um, Article 6 is all about cooperation between parties to the Paris Agreement and how they can enhance ambition through that cooperation. The cooperation envisaged under Article 6 includes government-to-government -government arrangements and things like international carbon markets. Some, such markets or arrangements can change the cost equation for countries. So it, it can allow some countries to take targets that would be, uh, would be larger or greater than they would um, do if they just looked at home and saw what they thought they could do um, <coughs> by f funding emissions reductions abroad. 
The other side of the equation that can change is a country that looks at what it can do and has a modest sense of what it can do can actually do a lot more transformative action at home if another country comes in and helps to fund that action for them. So this means that we will see investment uh, into countries that we would otherwise not see and we will see fl financial flows to those countries to help with that transformative change. Um, but, but environmental integrity is absolutely central, both um, in our uh, anticipation of those markets, but in the work that we're doing around them. Which takes me to this slide to tell you that there are two sides, as Joe said, to the negotiations. There's the inside the negotiation room and there's what's happening outside. And inside the negotiating room for Article 6, there are three jobs to be done. Three jobs to be done. Job one is that there needs to be robust accounting for any of these transfers that occur between countries. It's absolutely critical that none of these emissions reductions accounted twice because we need to know whether or not we're going to achieve the goal of the Paris Agreement and we can't have one country delivering an emission reduction, another saying, yeah, yeah, we did it, we, we counted that because, you know, we, we reduced our emissions and another country that potentially paid for it saying, yeah, we met our target too because we paid for them to do this this work over here. We cannot have double counting, and the expression double counting occurs many, many times in the Paris Agreement. No double counting, that is. So we have to build rules around that. We also have the central mechanism that's, that's um, designed to actually issue units uh, for projects or programs, and all of the rules of that have to be designed, including who's the supervising body, who's on it, and what kinds of things might be allowed to generate units. And lastly, there's a, there's a piece in Article 6 which is, what are the things we can do together cooperating that make the boat go faster that aren't about markets? And there, the Paris Agreement established a framework and instructed us to conduct a work programme. And so we need to focus on that as well. But just as importantly, and perhaps even more importantly, outside the negotiation, there are many, many people who are talking about how do we make this happen? How do we actually um, focus on what real environmental integrity in markets, carbon markets, looks like? And very few people have actually put pen to paper on that. Um, but New Zealand working with 18 other countries has started to write, what does this actually look like? What, might, what are the principles that underpin this? And so there'll be some side events that explore that very important issue. And there'll be other side events that say, so how are we going to get this cooperation going? Who's going to work with whom? Um, and that's an area we've been interested in too in the Asia-Pacific region where countries have got together and said, can we cooperate together? What could we do more if we work together? So those are the two areas of focus um, in carbon markets at the COP. And I'm now going to hand over to Stephen. Good, okay, thank you. Um, g'day, kia ora, everyone. Uh, so my name's Stephen Walter. I'm the uh, climate change specialist at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I've been uh, part of these negotiations for the last five years or so, formerly um, with the Ministry for the Environment. So I'm going to uh, take you through three slides. Uh, first on our interest in agriculture. Uh, second on uh, transparency and accounting. And the third on uh, ambition generally. So in terms of agriculture, um, I guess first of all, let's talk about the, the importance of agriculture, not just for New Zealand as Joe mentioned, but, but globally. So 119 countries have included agriculture in their um, INDCs or their NDCs, including 78 developing countries. Uh, 61 countries explicitly mentioned livestock in their NDC. And what we're seeing is that um, as more and more countries are starting to turn their attention to their long-term 
low emission development strategies for 2050, uh, they're starting to recognize that uh, the challenge that we have today around reducing emissions in agriculture uh, is for many of them tomorrow's challenge. And so they're taking an increasing interest in how New Zealand is approaching this challenge. Um, one of the things that we do is uh, we uh, provide active support to uh, these parties to design and implement their NDCs in a way that provides maximum benefit for farmers, society, and the environment. Uh, it's important, I think, to recognize the important contribution that enhancing agricultural practices can make to food security, uh, to rural livelihoods by improving climate resilience, and to emissions reductions through increased agricultural productivity. And that's what is commonly known as the uh, triple win, and I'll get uh, back to that a little bit more later. So again, with the inside-outside lens, the last program of work under Substa uh, on issues related to agriculture was agreed in 2013 and completed in 2015, and I can see Paul Melville up there who managed to suffer through most of that. Um, it's been pretty difficult since then to get uh, broad-based consensus on what the new program of work would look like. Um, the FAO, uh, so the Food Agriculture Organization, and the World Bank are working with others uh, to try and bring parties together outside of the negotiations to try and explore where is it that we uh, can find common ground, where are there differences of views, and I think the, um, the ultimate aim of that would be to then move forward uh, th inside the, the formal process. So outside the negotiations, um, we're uh, very keen to continue demonstrating our continued leadership uh, on agriculture and climate change, for example, through the Global Research Alliance, which New Zealand uh, founded, um, and through our work in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, particularly around uh, short-lived gases. Um, New Zealand experts host and participate in international workshops uh, aimed at sharing knowledge, transferring technologies, and best practice for implementing NDCs. Uh, and uh, we use uh, side events hosted by New Zealand on precision technology and climate data. We've got two of those coming up at this COP um, to advance global thinking on agriculture's role in delivering global reductions in greenhouse gases. Next to transparency and accounting. So here we haven't gone for the inside-outside split because most of this is inside the formal negotiating process. Um, for a lot of my time on the delegation, I was, what, uh, we, I was involved in what we call the deep substa. It's where all the geeks hang out. It's incredibly technical. Um, generally, most of the uh, guidelines, um, rules, uh, review procedures for transparency and for accounting were developed initially through the Substa. Um, what we're doing now uh, for both transparency and accounting is we're working to try and make those frameworks, the transparency and accounting frameworks, applicable in the context of the Paris Agreement. And we're trying to do that in a way that doesn't uh, put to one side all the very considerable body of work um, that's been built up through the Substa, the SBI, um, throughout the lifetime of the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol, and we're very lucky on our delegation to have uh, Helen Plume, who's not um, talking right now on transparency, but is seated right there and who's been to uh, every COP but one um, to, to help guide not just New Zealand but also um, other parties through this uh, very difficult process. So in terms of uh, transparency, um, for us, it, it's really the linchpin. It's fundamentally critical. It underpins the whole Paris Agreement. It's uh, key to increasing ambition as parties get used to measuring and reporting their data. They have a much better idea of what can be done. Um, and in terms of the actual mandate that's been delivered uh, by 2018, it's to provide guidance on reporting, on review, and uh, for multilateral consideration. Um, we often talk about uh, transparency as being the one article to rule them all. Um, not to, in the darkness, bind them, uh, but it certainly does bind all the other articles together. 
Um, and what we're trying to do is um, uh, make good on the Paris Agreement's uh, promise of a common transparency framework that provides flexibility uh, for parties as appropriate. In terms of accounting for NDCs, um, so I guess what we need to do there is, first of all, we need to be able to understand what parties are committing to. Uh, we need to see how they are tracking towards that target. Um, and because of that, uh, the guidance will need to uh, accommodate, um, oh, sorry, just quickly there, uh, the, the mandate that we're delivering is guidance on features, on information and accounting. So guidance on features, uh, what, um, what's the essence of a nationally determined contribution, what makes an NDC an NDC, um, the information that should be provided when parties communicate their NDCs uh, for the purpose of clarity, transparency and understanding, um, and accounting, how parties track progress towards achievement of their NDCs. So in order to make this applicable in the Paris Agreement framework, uh, the guidance needs to accommodate the, the universal nature of uh, obligations. Uh, so the equal legal footing uh, for all parties un under the Paris Agreement needs to reflect uh, the national determination principle of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and it also needs to reflect the diversity of nationally determined contributions that have been communicated. Um, so it's no uh, easy feat. Um, it makes a Kyoto Protocol style arrangement very difficult. Um, you're trying to balance you know, a, a top-down rules system versus um, the principle of national determination. Um, and in the KP, you had a single rule set that was applicable to all uh, developed countries under the KP. And now we're trying to deal with something which is applicable to all, um, but also taking into account the diversity of NDCs. So we're trying hard not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The baby is clinging on ferociously to the edges. Um, and by that, I mean that we're trying to draw from existing approaches. Um, so under the Kyoto Protocol, under the UN UNFCCC, there are various approaches. People have put a lot of work into that. Parties can draw from those approaches, uh, but there will be some parties whose NDCs uh, would not really accommodate some of these approaches. So we also need to be a bit flexible and think about how those parties can demonstrate achievement of their NDCs. Uh, one potential landing zone uh, that's been discussed is what's called a, a principles-based approach. So uh, parties need to explain what they're going to be doing. They need to explain how uh, this approach is consistent with environmental integrity, with the avoidance of double counting, and with the TAC principles, transparency, accuracy, completeness, uh, consistency, and comparability. Um, and they need to explain how this approach is appropriate for their NDC and their national circumstances. That's uh, one possible landing zone. Uh, and we're trying to um, work through over the course of this meeting and next year uh, to establish what the final landing zone will be. Next on ambition. Um, so as Joe mentioned, I'm exceedingly grateful to Fiji for having renamed the 2018 facilitative dialogue, the Talanoa Dialogue, which does trip off the tongue a little more. Um, and the, the dialogue there, uh, so Talanoa means that it, it's going to be inclusive, participatory, and transparent, uh, with a focus on building empathy and leading to decision making for the collective good. Um, just generally on ambition, we all realised that the INDCs and the NDCs that were put up uh, in the lead up to Paris are not going to get us there. Um, as a result, uh, one of the uh, one of the, the focus, uh, or the, um, a new focus in the Paris Agreement was to create a central ambition mechanism to enable uh, an increase in ambition over time uh, to allow us to eventually reach the, uh, or achieve the purpose of the Paris Agreement and the long-term goals. Um, there were two parts to that. The first was the, uh, the Talanoa Dialogue. Um, in 2018 to assess progress towards the long-term mitigation goal uh, set out in Article 4.1 um, with a view to informing the preparation of nationally determined contributions. Um, Joe mentioned that we uh, entered into force with the Paris Agreement a little sooner than uh, we'd thought in Paris. Uh, so exactly what that meaning, uh, what that wording means now, uh, we're not quite sure, but for example, parties will need to communicate or update their NDCs in 2020, 
Uh, so it seems uh, fairly logical to assume that parties would take into account the outcomes of the Talanoa dialogue as they do so. Uh, and then um, a global stop take uh, to take place every five years starting in 2023. Uh, the purpose of that is to take stock of the implementation of the Paris Agreement in order uh, to assess collective progress towards achieving the purpose and the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement. It needs to do that in a facilitative, comprehensive manner to include uh, mitigation, adaptation, and means of implementation. So that's finance, technology transfer, um, and, uh, sorry, what's this? <laughs> Capacity building, sorry. Um, now, this was, uh, and, and the outcome is to inform uh, parties in updating and enhancing in a nationally determined manner their actions and support. And all of this needs to take place in the light of equity and the best available science. All of this was agreed eventually in Paris. Um, what we need to do now is we need to actually make that work. We need to operationalize it. Uh, the mandate that we were given was to uh, work out the modalities, so how it would actually work in practice. Uh, who's going to be running this thing? Uh, are we going to have separate streams to look at mitigation, adaptation, means of implementation? Is it all going to be in one? Will there be a technical assessment first to feed into a political moment? Who, who would be running the technical and the political moments? All that detail needs to actually be worked out. And we also need to identify uh, further sources of input um, than were provided in the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement al already uh, gave a few, for example, the IPCC, the Standing Committee on Finance, um, there's an opportunity to uh, talk about new sources of input, for example, um, from the uh, Indigenous Peoples Platform. Um, we need this to run well. We put this in the Paris Agreement to make sure that we're able to deliver on the ambition of the Paris Agreement. And that's one of New Zealand's, uh, well, it's, it's for me, um, because I'm negotiating it, it's, it's my principal focus, it's a very significant focus for New Zealand um, to make this central ambition mechanism run well and deliver the results that we need it to. And now I'll be handing back to Joe. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, in uh, talking about the Talanoa Dialogue, uh, the Fiji uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Khan, uh, who is the, uh, the chief negotiator for Fiji, um, has very uh, um, aptly said it is driven by three questions, and this will apply to the global stock take as well. The three questions are, where are we now? Where do we want to be? And how will we get there? So those are, those are useful framing uh, questions, I think, for, um, uh, for the uh, ambition mechanism under the Paris Agreement. Now, of course, um, we, probably, we haven't got time to go through all the issues on the, uh, the sprawling UNFCCC agenda, but there are other key, key issues in the negotiations. Um, and always uh, top of the list is, is climate finance. Um, there, uh, there, there will be work uh, underway, um, particularly around accounting for uh, the provision of financial support to developing countries. This, that work is being done um, under the Substa. Um, it's also relevant, relevant, of course, to um, other aspects of the Paris Agreement work program. So transparency uh, that Steve has been talking about includes reporting guidelines and so on uh, around transparency of support provided um, and support needed or received by developing countries. Um, the uh, other financially related issue uh, is um, a, a question of the future of the adaptation fund. The adaptation fund being set up, um, it's, it's under the, uh, the uh, Kyoto Protocol and the question being um, whether and how um, to uh, give a future for the Adaptation Fund serving the Paris Agreement. Um, so there's some legal complications around that, but uh, the Adaptation Fund is seen as a hugely important source of finance 
for adaptation projects by uh, developing countries. They see it as smaller and more nimble uh, than the, uh, the, glo uh, the Green Climate Fund um, and uh, um, a, a really important part of the, the climate finance landscape. So that question will be, again, uh, addressed in, in Bonn. Um, the uh, roadmap um, to $100 billion reference there um, is again uh, um, a reference to developing countries, and in fact all countries, um, very, very strong interest in ensuring uh, that the undertaking to mobilise um, $100 billion US dollars per annum collectively um, by 2020 uh, that uh, this mobilised money to come from a combination of public and private sources uh, to support developing countries to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change. So um, questions will, uh, as they are every year, be raised about how we are tracking collectively towards that $100 billion uh, goal. Um, and uh, the, uh, there will be um, a strong push uh, for um, evidence of pre-2020 action. Um, and this comes to, uh, down to a lot of um, uh, pressure, I guess, on, on developed countries. Um, and the two aspects of pre-2020 action that are constantly um, identified are, first of all, ratification of the Doha Amendment to the Kyoto Protocol, which put in place the second Kyoto commitment period. Um, and just to, to record that New Zealand um, has ratified that, uh, that amendment. Um, and uh, the other component is delivery um, on the undertaking to uh, provide 100 or mobilize $100 billion per annum uh, by 2020. Last year, um, developed countries uh, worked together to prepare a document that was called a roadmap to $100 billion um, that uh, made projections to 2020 and on the basis of current pledges, uh, calculated that uh, there would be at least, um, and this was pretty conservative, um, 92 point something or other, 93 billion uh, US dollars uh, mobilized by 2020 um, from a variety of, of um, uh, public and, and private sources. There's no um, intention to update that roadmap this year, but uh, there'll be another update provided in 2018. The, um, the Global Climate Fund uh, has got off to um, a good strong start um, and we've been really pleased to see that uh, there have been a number of projects approved um, around the Pacific. However, on the part of developing countries and particularly um, uh, Pacific neighbours, there have been some concerns about the ease of access to finance through the Green Climate Fund and the speed with which uh, funds um, have started to be able to flow. Um, so through the GCF, um, our, um, our constituency sit on the, the board of the GCF, but also through the UNFCCC, we're working uh, to try and, and ease that situation, um, delivering on the uh, current pledge of providing $200 million in climate-related support uh, through to 2019, with the bulk of that focused on the Pacific and delivering a combination of clean energy, um, and resilience projects uh, um, around the Pacific. Um, and setting up a um, TAPA project, which is technical, access, uh, technical assistance for Pacific access uh, to help uh, the uh, Pacific countries be able to gain access to um, Green Climate Fund uh, uh, support. And that has uh, already proven to be very successful. Um, the, there have been concerns expressed uh, um, uh, along with the announcement of the intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. President Trump um, indicated that uh, the outstanding amount of the US pledge of $3 billion to uh, the Green Climate Fund would not be paid in. So some concerns expressed on the part of developing countries um, about the implications of that for uh, the, the provision of climate finance. Um, however, it is uh, also um, uh, worth, you know, do need to, to reinforce that the Green Climate Fund still has 
um, plenty um, of um, funding left to disperse, um, and that uh, at a certain point, uh, a replenishment will be triggered uh, and further funds will, will flow into the, the GCF. Um, a comment briefly uh, or quickly on adaptation, where uh, the, uh, uh, a big part of the Paris Agreement, of course, uh, has been to elevate adaptation uh, and the importance of adaptation to the impact of climate change, uh, sitting alongside uh, the urgent need to mitigate and reduce um, emissions. And a desire there um, on the part of developing countries to um, see the balance of public funding uh, provided for, for climate change to go pretty well 50-50 between mitigation and adaptation. So there's a, a lot of work um, uh, being done around that and certainly the, the Green Climate Fund has committed to um, aim for that 50-50 split. Um, for loss and damage, uh, there um, will be uh, a focus on the work of the Warsaw International Mechanism uh, for loss and damage, um, but uh, um, strong interest on the part of a number of developing countries to um, raise the profile of loss and damage in the context um, of the Paris Agreement and to do that in, in, in different ways. Um, but uh, it will be important, and Fiji wants to see the... Um, uh, the Warsaw International Mechanism uh, make good progress, um, particularly in the two new areas of its work, uh, dealing with risk transfer and um, displacement of, of people due to, to climate change. The last thing I've mentioned there is the Forum on the Impact of the Implementation of Response Measures, shortened to Response Measures. Um, that's um, been an interesting discussion uh, that has um, developed a little bit over the years and uh, is developing um, in uh, a different way from where it first started. It is now starting to look at the long-term implications of, of climate change and thinking about um, what it means for economic diversification, um, particularly for oil producing uh, countries, but not solely for them, um, economic diversification more, more generally, um, and also uh, as a place for discussing the just transition, um, which had made its way into the, the preamble of the, uh, the Paris Agreement and is uh, an important um, uh, aspect of the, uh, the, the, the long-term transition to a low-carbon economy. Um, just uh, talked about the action agenda, um, and here I just wanted to quickly note those three main themes. There is a huge program of side events and exhibits as part of the, uh, the climate action agenda. And the three main themes noted there are about enhancing ambition, promoting implementation, and providing support. Um, Steve alluded to um, the uh, event, special event we are hosting on precision agriculture technology, um, and just wanted to very quickly uh, indicate what that's about. So um, the, the event we are uh, hosting and organizing uh, is entitled Precision Technology for Agriculture Development, um, realizing that triple win uh, that uh, Steve was talking about, reducing emissions, building resilience, and improving farmer livelihoods. It fits with that, uh, those three uh, action agenda themes, and we want to showcase how precision agriculture can help all farmers, whatever scale they are operating on, whatever form of technology that they are using, from the most simple um, mobile telephone uh, through to driverless tractors um, or whatever it might be. We want to use the event to examine what barriers there might be to financing or take up um, of that technology um, and look at how deals uh, can be successfully pulled together and what sort of policy environments need to be in place uh, to help that to happen. So um, the event is co-sponsored by the World Bank. Um, it's supported by uh, Fiji's high-level climate champion, Minister Enia Seruaratu, and it will be held at the Fiji Pavilion on the 15th um, of the afternoon of the 15th of November. So if any of you are going to be in Bonn and you'd like to be there, um, then get in touch and we can give you the, the details for it. 
Um, so as ever, uh, we are, New Zealand um, is a very small cog uh, in a very big UNFCCC machine. Um, and we need to act smart to have any influence over uh, multilateral processes because we just simply don't have the economic clout um, to uh, get us into small rooms or guarantee that we will be listened to. So how do we do that? And just as a, um, a reminder, I guess, uh, these are the kind of, uh, well, this is the kind of role uh, we play to try and help um, ensure that uh, uh, the multilateral climate change system works and uh, delivers good results. So we want to be relevant and constructive um, through doing things like chairing. I'm chairing the, uh, uh, co-chairing the uh, APA. Helen Plume uh, regularly facilitates various uh, transparency-related uh, aspects of the negotiations. She's also um, an expert reviewer of other countries uh, um, reporting uh, exercises under the, the UNFCCC, which is a hugely important role. We work to build coalitions, um, and uh, particularly to build coalitions that cross divides, um, find bridging proposals so that we can overcome the inevitable, um, quite uh, divergent views within the UNFCCC. Um, and we do like to be an ideas engine, coming up with innovative solutions that are going to help uh, um, find an outcome. And then finally, we use our expertise and our influ influence to push for initiatives that are going to be scalable, things that we can work with other partners to help deliver. And we've just identified a few there. Um, as Steve had already mentioned, the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases, the GRA, with 49 member countries now. Um, a small group of Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform that we're also um, uh, promoting through the uh, WTO. Um, a uh, group of 19 countries that uh, in Paris signed a carbon markets declaration to ensure environmental integrity of carbon markets um, and also the precision agriculture um, events and uh, um, the follow-up we will do with partner countries. So, just to conclude, um, we uh, um, have said that this COP in Bonn is not one where uh, there is an expectation of final um, big decisions being taken, but it is a critically important COP to put the Paris Agreement work program on track for a successful conclusion in 2018. And it's not some bits of it can be done, other bits can be left, to have everyone on board, everything needs to be done uh, by the end of next year. It's going to be held in the buller spirit of inclusiveness, friendliness, and solidarity. And I do think the, uh, the international dynamic and tone um, is uh, a really, really positive one uh, at the moment and will be um, uh, reinforced in Bonn and to promote the Pacific concept of Talanoa. Um, so we're looking forward to going. Um, I'm going to stop talking now and uh, leave some time for questions. Just while you're gathering your thoughts, um, when we sent out invitations, we asked if there were questions people wanted to raise, um, they could um, write in and ask us. So I have received two questions, which I will address and then open the floor. Um, when I do open the floor, uh, you will need a mic in your hand um, before you start to speak uh, so that we can um, capture the, uh, um, the question clearly um, and would also appreciate it if you could identify who you are and where you, you come from. So the two questions, first um, from uh, World Vision, Carsten Bockermuhl, and I apologise to Carsten if I have not pronounced his surname correctly. Um, he asks, noting that the newly elected coalition government has committed to passing a Zero Carbon Act, setting up an independent climate commission and reviewing the ETS, how are those plans going to impact New Zealand's discourse and contributions at COP23? Well, um, as I said right at the beginning, uh, given that the new government is very recently formed, um, and there hasn't not been an opportunity yet to meet um, with uh, our new minister, James Shaw, to discuss this. 
um, it's a little difficult for me to, to answer in any detail. Um, but uh, I can say that uh, New Zealand, that the broad messaging about climate change, uh, consistent with uh, the new government's policy, will of course be reflected in New Zealand's uh, engagement at COP23. Um, and uh, um, I'm hopeful that there will be a national statement delivered that um, sets that out uh, very clearly. Um, the uh, actions uh, that were identified in the question are, are pretty, they, they are domestic policy intentions. So they will be happening back here at home, though of course there is a, a relationship with the international um, uh, side of things, uh, how we give effect to um, our uh, international undertakings. And um, I would expect, uh, you know, given the traditional um, support New Zealand has for the multilateral system, uh, that in that uh, Paris Agreement work program negotiations, we will continue to focus um, on ensuring we've got robust and credible guidelines and standards that are going to be applicable to all parties, that kind of level playing field, but with appropriate flexibility for those developing countries that need it. The second question comes from Rhys Taylor. Um, and he asks, has the time arrived for a greater public or community education effort in New Zealand on both climate change impact uh, adaptation and actions to reduce uh, carbon emissions from homes and businesses. And I just want to note that that issue of public education or awareness um, uh, had arisen in the context of the, the Paris Agreement. Um, and uh, there has been, uh, as a result, a new topic added to the subsidiary body agenda. Um, this happened in May this year. So it's gonna be picked up for the first time at COP23 in Bonn. Um, and uh, the priority or, or importance of education and public awareness um, is definitely being acknowledged internationally. So I would expect that uh, to catalyze consideration of what we can um, or should do here. So those were the two questions in advance. Happy to take any more from the floor. Liz Brinkford from New Zealand uh, Climate and Health Council, or Aotearoa. Um, two quick questions, thanks, Joe. How will today's Royal Society report on the climate impacts on human health, that basically climate change is fundamentally about human health impacts, influence New Zealand's negotiations? And the other question is, given the immediate health gains from well-designed um, climate action, will health now be represented in the delegations? Thanks. Thanks for, for those questions. So, so uh, yes, aware of the uh, Royal Society report, which was um, particularly focused, again, quite a domestic focus, looking um, at uh, adaptation considerations uh, and uh, the impact of, of climate change here, including, uh, of course, on, on public health. Um, so, uh, this is not going to be immediately or directly relevant to the, the negotiations themselves, which uh, you know, are around putting, as I said, flesh on the bones of the, the Paris Agreement. Um, it is around what we do domestically, how we respond, um, but what we will see and have seen out of the Paris Agreement um, is an expectation of um, enhanced reporting, um, on adaptation plans and priorities um, and uh, uh, actions that have been taken um, and including perhaps uh, some monitoring and evaluation. Um, so there, there's a step up in the expectations around um, reporting into the UNFCCC on that uh, and um, uh, guidance being drawn up to, to help. Um, Helen, I don't know if you wanted to if you wanted to add anything on that. Um, that I think is is where we will see. You know, it's as Steve mentioned. Once you start measuring things and monitoring, it gives you a much better basis for thinking about um, what action you can and should be be taking. 
Um, we, we don't have um, health directly, the Ministry of Health, directly on the delegation, um, probably um, because climate change impacts on every sector, we could potentially have representation from um, a, a, a huge number of government departments there. But what we do do um, is ensure that back home uh, we uh, have a good interagency process um, that uh, um, looks across uh, the different um, parts or different sectors um, and, and tries to get as aligned and coordinated a, a, an approach as possible. Next. Thank you very much, Joe, and all of you from NFAT. Um, Bets Ann Martin from Response Trust. Uh, Joe, just a little more on the education. Um, I wonder if you can tell us more about the Education Day and whether New Zealand is contributing to that. And also whether you see, I know it's very early days, <laughs> but whether you see much more, or scope for much more education policy development in New Zealand on climate education, because at the moment we have very little other than, uh, we, well, it's very active in NGOs, but in the formal sector we don't. And also perhaps a, a bit more about who is represented on the New Zealand delegation, you know, what, what sectors are, are represented. Thank you. Okay, thanks for, for that question. As far as the Education Day is concerned, um, uh, if you mean a financial contribution, um, no. Um, there are quite a number of theme days as part of the Climate Action Agenda. Um, what we have done um, uh, and continue to do is look through uh, the, um, the, the schedule of side events um, and identify those where we uh, have a particular interest um, and look to ensure uh, that we can uh, have somebody um, participate, well, attend, rather, and uh, um, be clear and, and report back on, on what has happened. If in that education day you believe there are particular side events uh, that we should prioritise, then I would recommend you just get in touch by email and, and draw them to our attention and, and give an indication of, of um, you know, why you think that one, that particular one is, is um, uh, worth covering. We don't have a large delegation um, and the first priority for negotiators is to cover the negotiations. Um, but we do uh, try to do our very best to track what's happening in the climate action agenda as well to the extent we've got resources available to, to be there. I can't answer your second question um, about doing more in New Zealand. That will need to um, be something that's discussed with, uh, with the new, new government. In terms of our delegation for the COP, regularly we have officials from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, from the Ministry for the Environment, from the Ministry for Primary Industries, and from the Treasury. That's the, the regular thing. Um, we um, this year will have uh, um, somebody looking at, at um, transport issues. The International Maritime Organization is in the process of negotiating a, um, an interim strategy on uh, um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a, there's a, a particular focus on IMO um, uh, issues at, at the, the, uh, in the second week of the COP this year. Dave, I think. Thanks. Um, thanks, Joe. It's Dave Frame from the New Zealand Climate Change Research Institute. Um, since you mentioned uh, side events, Victoria is also co-hosting one yes. this year. Um, Adrian is uh, doing one with Miles Allen and Keith Shine and Jan Fuglesvet from Cicero. So they're doing one on metrics of um, comparing different greenhouse gases in, in new ways and thinking about separating out sectors. On the education point just raised, there's actually a small initiative going on at Victoria where we're trying to look across the education, uh, the primary and secondary sectors and um, look at new opportunities there for climate change education. Um, and finally, on the, in the tertiary bit on education, we're actually starting a master's in climate change uh, here, climate change science and policy here at Victoria next year. So that might be of interest for some of you at least, thanks. I think I'll enrol. 
Um, we had a lot of questions from just there, but uh, Lorraine, where are we? Where are we going next? Uh, Kia ora to everybody, Liam Rutherford, uh, NZDI. Thank you, uh, Joe, and the other people that have presented today. Um, it's been great to see it uh, being presented in such an easy to digest way. Um, are you able to make comment on progress towards uh, just transition for uh, workforces that are uh, increasingly affected by climate change? Um, the only, I can't make much more comment than I made in the, the presentation itself. Um, which is that uh, under the work of the uh, forum uh, on response measures, I'm using the, uh, the um, shortened title, um, that uh, is a, a forum in which the question of a just transition uh, is starting to be raised as, as a potentially useful uh, aspect of the work of the, the response measures forum. Um, and it's an area we would see as, as being very fruitful for discussion within, the, uh, within that context. So we'll hope that uh, it will make. There's um, uh, a full, at least one full day workshop on response measures in advance of the, uh, um, uh, the COP official opening. Um, so that'll be a, a, an opportunity for the beginnings of an informal discussion before the, uh, the COP itself starts. Kia ora, my name is Kapua Smith and I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is around uh, Indigenous participation. Is there going to be a delegation of tangata whenua going to COP23 this year and has the government supported an Indigenous delegation to go, go across? And my second question is around consultation with industry, businesses and other stakeholders. What consultation is undertaken prior to these negotiations um, to help New Zealand form its position, and who is that consultation currently undertaken with? So on the, the first question, um, there are iwi representatives frequently on the New Zealand delegation, not this year. This is not because it was a, um, a decision not to have them. It was their decision not to um, uh, prioritise being at the COP this year. Uh, I'm sure there will be iwi represents, representatives on the, the delegation next year when we are expecting those, um, those final decisions to, to be made. I mentioned the Indigenous Peoples Platform, um, so we will be uh, engaging directly in that, uh, and there will be uh, at least one uh, represent, tangata whenua representative who will be uh, participating actively in the Indigenous Peoples Platform. Um, and that is a significant new development uh, launched as part of the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, so um, we are looking forward to seeing that um, up and running and, and providing, a, um, I guess, a more uh, clear uh, mechanism for participation uh, of um, Indigenous peoples in the, the UNFCCC process. Um, as far as consultation is concerned, um, it depends on, on the issues. Um, the, the broad negotiating mandate is one that goes through a cabinet process each year. Um, it is over to, to government at what points uh, um, and on what issues. Um, formal consultations with um, stakeholders and the wider public are held. The last one uh, was around New Zealand's uh, nationally determined contribution. Um, and uh, um, I think it's in, in those areas in particular um, where there's certainly been a, um, a strong um, recognition of the need to consult uh, widely with, uh, uh, with interested stakeholders on, on that. But I can't um, sort of prejudge what might happen with uh, a new minister and a new government but uh, take the point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the importance of measurement and monitoring. Um, so I'm John Hooker from the Northland Innovation Centre. Okay. Um, one of the areas we're looking at is um, sustainable agriculture, that sort of thing. Um, uh, is there any uh, international strategy being considered for the potential value and uh, 
a function of satellite remote sensing, Earth observation, of, of satellite remote sensing, so data from satellites, um, monitoring agricultural performance, um, climate change effects that uh, that monitoring can observe. Is there any thought about how uh, existing and perhaps future new services from satellite could aid the cause and be made available uh, to all parties? Um, there probably is in different ways. It's not part of the, the rules negotiations. Um, Victoria um, from MPI, Victoria Hatton, Hatton might uh, have a comment to make. Um, Lorraine, sorry, can we have a can we have a mic here just for um, a comment from Victoria? Um, but uh, but I mean yes, uh, it's just not something that is uh, kind of pursued formally within the UNFCCC process. Uh, yes, um, Joe. thanks. Just to follow up from that, there is, um, there's many initiatives using remote sensing and um, GIS and other technologies to monitor um, everything from soil, moisture, soil condition through to the number of livestock. Um, the UK in particular is leading um, a couple of global projects looking at um, earth observation. But in the side, on the sidelines of COP, we have um, one of the side, side events that we're running is on climate data and the use of climate data and how we can unpack some of the barriers to accessing um, that, that data from Earth observation and making it more accessible. Um, talking about ownership um, of what we call big data. Um, so it's very early, very early days, but it is something that's very much on our agenda. Yeah, and it is hugely relevant too, of course, to um, the two um, aspects of um, support for developing countries that um, Steve was struggling to remember. Uh, the technology transfer and capacity building, um, it's, it's very relevant to, to both of those, which are uh, important components of um, getting a functioning uh, agreement under the UNFCCC. I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. Yeah, thank you, Nathan Ross from Victoria Law School. Um, you mentioned the, um, the Warsaw work on loss and damage and the focus on migration, displacement and relocation. Um, two questions about it. One is, what is the expected output from that? Is it guidelines or hard law or something? You know, what's their expectation from that work stream? And secondly, is it recognised that New Zealand will likely be a destination country for climate relocation in the Pacific and therefore what is New Zealand's position on that topic at the moment? For the, the first question on the output from the Warsaw International Mechanism work, I'm not sure if I've got a member of the delegation here who's able to answer that in uh, detail. Seamus, front seat. I'm not sure if it's a report or a what's exactly due. Yeah, um, sort of hard to say at present. Sorry, I didn't catch you where you were. Hi. Um, hard to say at present. We don't expect the outcomes until COP24. Um, so the whim uh, goes through a process, uh, as I'm sure you're well aware, of having uh, executive committee XCOM meetings. Um, those XCOM meetings and the new uh, task force for displacement, they're going to bring recommendations that will be addressed at COP24. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have some more clarity around what those will be uh, in the meetings in the next couple of weeks. Thanks very much. And as far as your second question is confirm, uh, concerned, again, um, there's not a lot I can say at the moment other than what um, we've read um, in the papers or heard on the, on the radio, um, and uh, that clearly uh, identifies climate migration um, as an issue this government will, uh, will pick up. So that's, that's about all I can say at, at this point. Um, last question. Tēnā koe Joe, uh, ko Julian Hekia Hove. Um, I work for Caritas. Um, last COP21, uh, well, uh, the, the briefings that you did daily with all those yes. representatives across civil society um, and the delegation were incredibly helpful for um, certainly for me personally, but I think for a number of us, and it enabled us to meet each other too and to hear what was going on. 
Um, will you be having similar daily briefings in Bonn? Um, and how will we get on the list for that? And then just secondly, Caritas will be having a side event on the 7th of November with the FAO, and I'll be in the spirit of Telenoa telling the stories that um, are in our environment report, for which MFAT are a contributor to as well. Tenakwe. Kia ora for that. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, on the first question, um, daily, the, the plan is certainly for um, daily stakeholder briefings to, to continue. Um, I won't be in a position to lead those, uh, as I will be um, pretty occupied uh, chairing the ad hoc working group on the Paris Agreement, the APA. Um, the, as APA chair, um, the, my co-chair and I will hold at least one um, uh, briefing for, uh, for NGOs, for stakeholders, um, over the course of the, um, uh, the COP. And that will be very clearly uh, advertised and, and um, the NGO organisations will be uh, uh, advised of that by the Secretariat directly. Um, if you're interested, uh, or anybody who's interested in the um, stakeholder briefings, contact Seamus Dunn, with two Ns, um, and uh, uh, if you email him, uh, he will add you to our database and make sure that, uh, that we contact you and, and give you the opportunity to, to be there. Sorry? Yes, so it's Seamus, S-E-A-M-U-S, dot dun, d-u-n-n, -N -N, at mfat, dot g-o-v-t, dot n-z. Sorry, we should have put that up on the, uh, on the, in fact, we might have done, did I? No. <laughs> that was it. So I've just got one quick thing, um, not a question, but there was a question about Tangata representation at COP this year. And just in case anyone was interested, I know that there will be some people from New Zealand going to lobby around the Indigenous platform. But also this year, for the first time, there's going to be an Indigenous youth delegation who'll be there. And again, their role is primarily to be lobbying on that front. And they are called Te Arafatu, and they are also crowdfunding. So if anyone is interested in donating to help them get there, I know that they've already kind of overcommitted for their flights, and if you're in debt, so uh, yeah, come and ask me, and I'd be happy to share the link. Thanks, Rachel. It's good to know. Um, okay, I think uh, we have run out of time, or we um, do definitely need to vacate the room here. So thank you all very much indeed for your attention, uh, for your excellent questions, and uh, we will be back in touch after uh, the COP and Bond to give a briefing on how it all went. <laughs>